Very well. A story. Once upon a time... Oh, by the way, children, do you know who probably was the very first storyteller to ever say once upon a time? Who? Aesop. Who? Aesop. Spell it. Well, (laughs) A-E-S-O-P. That's not a name. Why, no, it was Aesop's name. And he told many stories. And all of his stories started with once upon a time. And ended with a lesson. That doesn't sound like fun. Yeah, but they are, though. Some of them. And some of them are very sad. Yeah, and some of them are kind of scary. But from all of them, we learned something, something important to know. Aesop, spelled A-E-S-O-P, was a very wise man. Tell us why. Very well. Once there was a farmer a very poor farmer. He lived way out in the country on a very small farm. He lived alone, and no matter how hard he worked his farm, he never could quite make a living, and a lot of the time he was actually hungry. He didn't have any livestock on his farm, like a horse to help with the plowing, or a cow to give milk to drink. The only other living creature to share the farmer's loneliness was a goose, a very thoughtless goose. Half the time it didn't even lay an egg for its poor farmer's dinner. And many a time the farmer went hungry to bed because the goose was such a lazy goose. One day, as the farmer was leaving the goose's empty nest, the goose looked after him. We well, looked so sad, thought the goose, and so lonely. I never noticed before, and it's all my fault. I have been a thoughtless creature. Tomorrow I'll make amends. I lay him a nice fresh egg. Oh, he'll be so surprised and so pleased. The goose felt better. I'll do more than that, she thought excitedly. I'll not just lay an ordinary egg, which can't be good enough for such a kind and patient man. I'll lay a golden egg. Won't that be a surprise? Well, the goose was so excited, she could hardly get to sleep that night. And when finally she did doze fitfully, she dreamed of the morrow and the wonderful plan she had hatched. The next day, the farmer came as usual to the nest, not very hopefully, so his surprise was doubly great when he found in the nest, shining in the sunshine, an egg of gold. At first, of course, he thought he must be dreaming. But he held it in his hands and stared. A golden egg. How could anything so fabulous happen to him? He wept for joy, and this made the goose feel good all over. What a change. And the same thing happened the next day. When the farmer went to the nest for his egg, another golden one. The farmer now was rich. He could buy all the food he needed. He was now rich and well-fed and not lonely anymore. So many newfound friends. Every day the goose laid a golden egg, and every day the farmer changed a little. As he grew richer, he also grew greedier. And one day the thought passed his mind, why doesn't that silly goose lay two golden eggs a day? All the farmer thought about now was his goose, his very lazy, thoughtless goose, who only laid him one golden egg a day. He hung around the nest more and more. He began to abuse his goose, to threaten her even. I know you must be full of golden eggs. You are my goose, and therefore they are my eggs. And the more he thought about his golden riches, the more obsessed he became with the idea of having many, many golden eggs. And then he thought, I have only to cut her open and take all the golden eggs. And he ran to the butcher shop for a knife. The goose, of course, knew that from the day she laid that first golden egg, things had been different. She had only tried to be helpful. Tomorrow I'll go back to regular eggs, she thought, or if he's going to be this mean, scolding me and all, I'll just maybe go back to not laying any eggs. The farmer ran back to the nest. He had a big butcher knife. The goose looked at him. She was afraid. She was all over goosebumps. He wouldn't dare, she hoped, hopefully. He wouldn't kill the goose that laid the golden eggs. But as we know, she was a pretty stupid goose, and she was a wrong goose, too, because 
He did. The minute he had done it, though, he realized what he had done. Oh, dear, he cried miserably, because he was a miserable man. Now I have nothing at all. Moral, the greedy who want more lose all. Somebody start me. Once upon a time, there lived a giant flea who... Oh, no, 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 please, no fleas, please. This is about cheese. <laughs> the crow and the cheese. Once upon a time, there lived a big, black, beautiful crow with long, shiny wings. She had a strong, sharp bill, and she loved nothing more than to have a piece of cheese in her bill, ready for eating. Early each morning, she was up with the birds and out searching for this favorite delicacy. She looked very beautiful against the sky, wheeling and swooping, her beady eyes alert, scanning the countryside. Now, there also lived in the same region a fox. Now, this fox happened also to be especially fond of cheese, and every day he went searching, but somehow he didn't come back with cheese nearly as often as the crow did. He would return to his lair. What's a lair? A fox's house. Oh! Uh, now, where was I? Start me, Bobby. Once upon a time... You uh, were past that. Oh. You were at the fox's house. Oh, yes. Well, he would return to his lair at dusk, foot sore and with his fur all full of brambles, but with no cheese and his mouth just watering for a nice, creamy, yellow piece of succulent cheese. He would be particularly vexed when he would see the crow returning to roost, a piece of cheese clamped firmly in its beak. Oh, he would cry in frustration and beat his poor, sore paws on the ground, which made him cry even more. Then why did he do it? Because he was frustrated. What? Frustrated. A fox's house. No, no. Frustrated is, is what I will be if you do not stop interrupting, please. No. One night, he was particularly hungry, and the crow flew over right on schedule. There goes the cheese express, he thought bitterly. And then he thought some more. He thought, I'm smarter than that crow. I should be able to get twice the amount of cheese. And he kept on thinking, and I'll do it the easy way, and it won't be so hard on my feet either. And then he went to sleep, and he slept all night and all the next day. And he woke up just about dusk, feeling very rested and very pleased with himself. And very hungry, I bet. Yeah, I bet he was hungry. He had thought of a plan, see. He watched the sky. Do you know what he was looking for? The cheese express! <laughs> exactly, the cheese express. Right on schedule, the crow flew over with an extra large piece of cheese, it seemed, to the fox. The fox stood up. Oh, good evening to you, Mistress Crow, he called. The crow stopped in flight and looked down. How? She treaded air. She was surprised that the fox had even noticed her. She nodded. She couldn't speak, of course. Because she had the cheese in her beak. Yes. Such lovely flying weather, the fox continued. The crow nodded again. And you fly so beautifully. The crow smiled and dipped her wings gracefully several times. The fox knew he was on the right track. Your wings are only surpassed in beauty by your sharp, artistic claws. Well, the crow threw back her head and executed several pirouettes and came to rest on point. Hardly moving her wings at all, she was very pleased, being at heart a vain creature, and she was falling for all that fox's sweet talk. As her friend the trout could have told her, hook, line, and sinker. The fox's mouth was watering so for that cheese that when he spoke again, he sounded all blubbery. The crow thought he was merely being overcome with her pristine beauty. What kind? What kind of beauty? Mm -hmm. Beautiful beauty. She smiled a wider smile. The fox noticed that the cheese loosened a little in her grasp. But, cried the fox, I hear that surpassing everything is the beauty of your voice. Well, the crow was a little taken aback at this, having thought that her voice, like all crows, was a bit on the raucous side. But vanity, vanity... She chose to believe what the fox was saying was true. Now the fox was up on his hind legs, almost beside himself. He was dancing around and drooling all over his chest. 
Please, Mistress Crow, make me the happiest creature in the forest. Sing for me. Well, the crow blinked. Sing, she thought. But of course. <laughs> she opened her mouth and out came the most ear-hurting core of a sound, and also out came what? The cheese! That's right. And the fox caught it and swallowed it so fast that he almost didn't even taste it. The crow, of course, was stunned. Now then, we should all know the moral of this story. Don't sing with your mouth full. Good, but Aesop sort of had another one in mind. If you don't mind, Aesop thought... Flatterers are not to be trusted. This is the story of the hare and the hound. Well, look, suppose you help me and, and, and we'll all tell it, huh? Fine. Now, of course, the important part is the part of the hare. I'll play that. I'll bet it's the best part. Now, the part of the hare sounds like this. Now, uh... There's the part of the hound. Uh, Ray, you, uh, you be the hound. I want to be the hound. No, you be the mother hound. Then there's an old goat. Who wants to be the old goat? How old? Oh, six or seven. I'll be it. Thank you. Now you all know your part, huh? Yes. Good. Once upon a time, there was a hound dog. Uh, 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 but no, no, please, wait for your music. Oh. Once upon a time, there was a hound dog, a hunting hound dog, a lazy hunting hound dog. He was known more for his laziness than for his hunting. Morning after morning, it was the same thing. He wouldn't get up. Morning after morning, his mother would say, get up, get up. Morning after morning, he would just smile sleepily, turn over, go back to sleep. Get up, get up. If you want any breakfast, you'll have to go fend for yourself this morning. What's fend? He was awake now. Go catch your own rabbit. The hound went out into the late morning air. The sun was bright. He squinted. He shook himself and mumbled. Well, I might as well fend. And he started at a nice easy gait toward the rabbit thicket. As he drew near, he could hear laughter and fast rabbit talk. The hares were relaxing. Who would come looking for breakfast at this time of day? Then the hound was upon them. A young hare happened to look up. Yep, it squealed. And then the hare darted away across the meadow. Now I'll have to give chase, I suppose. And away he went after the fleeing hare. He was halfway across the meadow. The hare seemed to be getting farther and farther away. The hound put on more speed. The hare did likewise. I don't care too much for this fending. When he got to the edge of the meadow, the hare was nowhere to be seen. Woo! Fooled the hound. An old goat who was eating his lunch nearby came over. He had watched the whole scene. A fine hunting dog you are. Aren't you ashamed? Letting a creature one-six your size make a monkey out of you. Old goat, he said. After all, I was only running for my breakfast. That hare was running for his life. The old goat wandered away. The hare was long since home. The noon sun was warm. The hound was asleep. The moral is... Necessity is our strongest weapon. Well, thank you very much. You were very good not butting in. Now tell another one about the fox. No, I like the fox. Well, what I, but I can't, couldn't, but I couldn't tell. I, I'm, I'm going to tell one about the lion. See. I don't want the lion. I know, but I. I won't listen. I'll spot. I'll sing or something. Oh, don't be a dog in the manger. What did you say? I said he was a dog in the manger. Why? Well, I don't know exactly, but it seemed to fit. It does, and very well, too, and you have given me my next story. About right. a fox? No, right. no, 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 right. no, the dog in the manger, and no outside help, please, of any kind. The farmer's boy was busy with his chores. He'd slopped the pigs and fed the chickens, and now he was in the barn. His dog was with him. 
His dog always tagged and wagged along with his young master. He didn't do anything to help or anything. He just followed along. Now the farmer's boy was cleaning out the manger. Then he would fill it with nice, fresh hay so the work ox, who would soon be in from the field, would have a nice dinner. When he had finished, he started back to the house for his own supper. But his dog didn't follow along this time. He was sort of tired, and he had had his eye on that manger full of hay. Not to eat, of course, but what a nice, comfortable bed it would make. Without further ado, he hopped up into the manger, circled around, pawing at the straw the way a dog will do, and then flopped contentedly, and in no time was fast asleep. The ox came slowly back from the field, a good day's work under his belt and looking forward to an early dinner. When he got to his stall all ready to relax, he was surprised to see the dog curled up sound asleep. I'll eat around the edges first, he thought, before I disturb him. What manners, anyway? Would I lie down in his food? Certainly not. He took a tentative bite. The dog woke up and started barking. Go away, he cried. Can't you see I'm sleeping? I can indeed, said the ox, and I can also see where you are sleeping. The dog barked again. Go away. This is not a bed, you know, said the patient ox. This is my food. Another bark, going into a slight growl. I wouldn't think of eating your bed. The dog growled louder. He was just as stubborn as the ox was sensible. The ox continued trying to reason with the dog. If you ate some of my dinner, I wouldn't mind at all. No one has ever gone away from my house hungry. But you will neither eat it nor let me eat it. For his pains, the ox received another threatening growl. Now the farmer's boy came back to the barn looking for his dog. He stood in the doorway for a while listening. Food meant to be eaten is now being wasted, which is a very bad thing in itself. But what shocks me most of all, concluded the ox, is your complete lack of manners. The boy slipped into the barn. Dog, he said in a very stern master's voice, I am ashamed of you also. The dog whined now and jumped out of the manger and with a hangdog expression slunk slowly out into the night. I apologize for my dog, said the farmer's boy. Oh, that's all right, said the ox, nibbling at last at his supper. No actual harm done. The farmer's boy left. The ox took a big mouthful, except, he thought to himself, it's a little warm in the middle. Moral, some begrudge others what they cannot enjoy themselves. Thank you, thank you, I think, but... I didn't expect to be quite that alone during the story. I mean, no music or sounds or anything. The best laid scheme often has a kickback. Who said so? Aesop. A-E-S-O-P. Never mind. We'll go back to the music anyway, for, as Shakespeare said, music hath charm to soothe the savage beast. Who said that? Shakespeare. How do you spell it? Never mind, Bobby. Music maestro? <laughs> Everyone to the spring, cried the hare, and all the animals jumped up and followed. Last one there is a rotten egg, the hare called over his shoulder. Well, he knew he wouldn't be. He would be first, as usual. That's why he was always playing these running games. Oh, he loved to run. He ran very fast. He always won. He knew, though, as did all the other creatures, who would be last. The tortoise would be. He always was. He just could not run. He was not built for speed. There wasn't a fast bone in his body. He was never the first one there, unless, as usual, he was the last to arrive and then just stayed there waiting for the others to come back there again. Then he was first. His name was Sheldon, but no one had called him that for many years. They were so used to calling him Rotten Egg. They expected him always to be last, and he was. He didn't like being last, mind you. He would have loved to come in, say, 19th or 30th or any place farther up front. When he would finally arrive any place, the others were usually ready to leave. He actually saw very little of his fellow creatures, which was a pity because he loved good company. But so long as the hare was so full of energy, the tortoise was more en route 
than arrived. He was never at one place long enough to get the feel of it. Some of the fastest animals he barely recognized. There were so many stories he didn't know the beginnings of. He would get there just for the end. The others had been at the spring, had drunk their fill, had told their stories. Here comes old Rotten Egg, the hare said. We're on our way to the meadow to play games. And he was on his feet. The last one there is a Rotten Egg. And they were off again. The tortoise had a nice long drink from the spring. How quiet it is, he thought. And then he set himself to follow in the footprints of the other animals. After plodding along for a time, he came to the open meadow. It was quiet here, too. The animals were all resting now after their games. Join us, said the old goat. They all liked the tortoise. They just didn't know him very well. I'm real pooped, said the old goat. I don't know when I've played Kitty Wants a Corner before. Not much of one, said the frog. The cats always win. Well, you only like leapfrog, said a beaver nastily. I thought the hare won everything, said the tortoise. At this point, the hare came over to the tortoise. Ah, <laughs> said the old goat, here we go again. I'll race anybody to the apple tree. Oh, relax, said the fox. Let's talk to old Rotten Egg here. Uh, oh, I mean, I beg your pardon. I can beat anybody, cried the hare. This is a nice place here, said the tortoise. It won't be for long. I feel a race coming on, said the grasshopper. Oh, I hope not, said the tortoise. I'm just beginning to know you all. Sissies, cried the hare. All of you, sissies. Oh, everyone was uncomfortable. The tortoise could see the other creatures didn't want to race. Race, race, cried the hare. Race. Oh, go race yourself, said the tortoise. And you know, he surprised himself by saying it. <laughs> the frog croaked, and several others laughed. What did you say, said the hare? No one had ever spoken to him like that before. No one said anything. I said, said the hare, pushing his face up close to the tortoise's face, what did you say? The tortoise gulped. Then a chipmunk spoke up. This chipmunk was considered quite a wit. He liked to play practical jokes, too. I'll tell you what he said, said the chipmunk with a straight face. He said he would race you himself. A tortoise race a hare? That's what he said, said the chipmunk. And because this promised to be an interesting interlude, one of the squirrels sang out from the trees. I heard him. Oh, that's what he said. All right, I heard him. Well, the tortoise could only blink. The hare looked at the tortoise. Well, he's crazy, he said. I heard too, yelled a crow, and he also said you were a lousy runner. Now look here, cried the tortoise. But his voice was drowned out in a chorus of animal noises, everyone yelling and screaming, what fun, what fun. But it wasn't fun for the hare. He was mad. And it wasn't fun for the tortoise. He was mad too. Where were their manners, these creatures? They knew he couldn't run. The tortoise didn't like being the butt of their jokes. He began knocking on his shell with his foot. Quiet, called the fox. The tortoise wants to speak. Everyone was quiet. All eyes were turned upon him. What you did not hear me say was that I could beat him without half coming out of my shell, he yawned. He meant it, too. They all looked at each other. Well, they were stunned. The hare was more stunned. Well, the tortoise was the most stunned of all. <laughs> And, like they say, from such a happenstance beginning was the great race spawned. It wasn't such a great race, really, as races are run, that is. It wasn't run at all. The race part was a travesty. It was the winning of the race, the finish. Oh, that was something. As the animals gathered at the finish line could testify. Well, here we are at the finish line. We haven't even started the race yet. Uh, now, where was I? Oh, as the hare would say, everybody back to the starting line. The starting point, by the way, was the apple tree. The finish line, the big oak tree at the spring. Well, it all seemed sort of crazy. No one expected for a minute that the tortoise could win. The hare had never lost. It was crazy. The hare, of course, thought it was, but he was enjoying himself hugely, making arrangements, laying down rules, loosening his muscles. Old Rotten Egg, well, there are just days. What had he done? How had it happened? Just when did things begin to get out of hand? 
The eagle was the judge on account of his eyes. He would follow the race from the sky. The frogs, several good jumps apart, lined the course from beginning to end. The hound, who ran a fair country mile himself, was chosen as the hare's second. To be fair, the tortoise had to have a second, too, and finally a beetle with a sore leg was appointed. The animals had never had so much fun. Let's get this show on the road, bellowed the ox at last. Everyone to his post, cried the monkey. Ho oh, hum, said the hare, and he yawned, a great big yawn, and everyone laughed. Well, the tortoise was on the starting line, but he had withdrawn into his shell, and he was having a last-minute pep talk with himself. Just do the best you can, he said to himself, and don't give up. He heard a knock on his shell. You ready in there, cried the wolf. The tortoise stuck his head out. He nodded it. It made him a little dizzy. I'll run to the finish line and then come back and help you get started, said the hare. Quiet, roared the lion. On your mark, get set, go. Well, the rabbit was out of sight before the tortoise's front foot hit the ground. As I said, it wasn't much of a match because just around the bend in the road, the rabbit had stopped and was eating some clover at the side of the road. He looked back and there was no sign of a rotten egg. So he went on eating. The clover was young and tender. He forgot about the race. He forgot about the tortoise. The tortoise, still quite a ways back, was plodding along at a pretty consistent pace. He wasn't thinking about anything, certainly not about winning. He just wanted to get to the finish line and then forget the whole thing, if he possibly could. The hare took a side trip, stopping off to see a second cousin who had been ill a lot lately with rabbit fever. He came back to the road, and way back there, that speck, that was the tortoise. Well, he looked at the oak tree, which was not too far away. <laughs> I won't even bother to cross the finish line yet, he said. And he waved to the crowd waiting there. I'll just lie down and pretend I'm taking a nap, he thought. That will get a laugh. And he did, and it did. And down the road, the tortoise kept coming. How relaxing it is here thought the hare with his eyes closed. I really do have time for a nap. He opened one eye and peeped down the road at the tortoise still plodding along back there. He closed his eyes all the time in the world, he thought drowsily. I'll wake up and make a very dramatic last minute win. He smiled. <laughs> that should be a crowd pleaser. He slept. The tortoise plodded along. The whole time the hare was sleeping, the tortoise plodded along. Soon he passed the sleeping hare. He never slowed his pace, though, but he kept his eyes on the finish line, and the hare's snores soon grew fainter behind him. Wouldn't it be funny, the tortoise thought, if I should win this... No, but no, I mustn't jinx myself. He made his mind a blank. He plodded. The hare slept and snored. One extra loud snore woke the hare. He stretched and he yawned. He opened his eyes and he looked back down the road. The tortoise wasn't there. He jumped up. He looked the other way toward the finish line and there, almost ready to cross, was the tortoise. The hare yelled and dashed off as fast as ever he could dash. Look, everybody, look, here I come. The crowd cheered, but they were cheering now for the tortoise and calling encouragement to him. You can do it, I know you can, screamed the chipmunk. Don't panic now, cried the fox. Steady does it. The hare put on a final desperate burst of speed and he reached the finish line just after the tortoise had crossed over. The winner, the winner, all the creatures cried. They mobbed the tortoise. They were all over him, shaking his hands, pounding him on his shell. How in the world did you do it, said the amazed hound. I just plodded, said the equally amazed tortoise. The crowd screamed again, the winner, the winner. Then the fox looked over and he saw the hare, his tongue hanging out. Hey, rotten egg, he called. Come on over and meet the winner. All the creatures laughed. The hare was so ashamed, he just crept away. The wise old owl sort of summed it up for them all when he said, slow and steady wins the race. 